As we've taken some time to consider the life of David, uh, I will say this. I recognize that you could spend, as it relates to the scriptures, uh, you could spend a lot of time studying the life of David. Uh, as it relates to First and Second Samuel, you could spend a lot of time, moment by moment, um, looking at the experience that David had, not only as a man, but as, uh, as God calls him, a man after God's own heart. You could spend uh, m- even more time in the book of Psalms when you just go through and consider those Psalms that we know for sure that David wrote. And you could spend a ton of time studying those as well as those we think he wrote. Uh, Not only that, then you would come along to like First Chronicles and there would be more David perspective. I recognize that eight Wednesday nights is not a long time to take to look at the life of David. But as we have, hopefully a number of things have happened. The first of which is, All of us have had our interests about this man of God peaked to where maybe we would spend some more time even on our own just reading and studying more about uh, David. Um, At the same time, our hope and prayer has been that we could pick up principles from David's experience that help us in our desire to be a people after God's own heart. Because ultimately, like, isn't that the case and I know that, uh, that, 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 that that seems like a high and lofty goal. I don't know about you guys, but when I look in the mirror, uh, I'm not necessarily <laughs> overwhelmed with confidence in terms of my Christianity. Quite often when I look in the mirror, I'm, 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 I'm kind of underwhelmed by my own performance and then overwhelmed by my own mistakes and regrets and so on and so forth. And yet, even as we go through this and have gone through this material, we recognize that uh, ultimately the key to David being called a man after God's own heart was God himself. Uh, David, in, for better or worse, had a habit of pointing the direction of his life towards Yahweh and the God of the covenant that he made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and continued to maintain through Moses, and then even renewed through David, was faithful beyond even our own ability to get or even understand. Remember, David's story started out, he was just an an unknown shepherd boy who was anointed by the prophet Samuel uh, to be the next king to replace Saul. And one of the ideas that we realize is that A person after God's own heart doesn't have to be known by the people who matter most because ultimately they're known by the one who matters most. And that's great hope for us because as we place our faith in Jesus, there's this intimate knowledge in terms of our relationship that God has with us that no matter if the world thinks we're a big deal or not, or no deal, (laughs) uh, uh, the Lord is absolutely aware of us. According to the scriptures, he's the one who formed us in our mother's womb. He is intimately aware of every single moment in his omniscience of who and how we are. So he's always aware, and that should bring us encouragement to go ahead and point our direct, our lives, the direction of our lives towards this high and lofty goal of being known as a person after God's own heart. Because it doesn't matter what people say. God's got a perspective on our lives that is perfect and in Christ uh, perfectly appropriate. Um, Right after that, remember, I don't know if you guys recall, but uh, Pastor Josh uh, taught through that famous story of David and Goliath. And one of the ideas that comes out of that is that David, as a man after God's own heart, cared more about the Lord's honor than he did about the enemies. He was more concerned for the Lord's honor than he was even for his own life, so to speak. Because if we're just looking at that episode from a human perspective, outside looking in, we're thinking, uh, this young man's doomed. He's going to get it because this giant of a man 
uh, is a trained killer, a trained assassin, and David is surely in trouble, and therefore so is all of Israel with him. And yet we know that God was faithful there. But there was this internal commitment that David had about the greatness of God and the honor of God, that that, ov- that was the most important thing to him, even above and beyond his own life. Uh, after David killed Goliath, remember, Saul is overcome or overwhelmed by it all, and in a jealous rage, decides that David's got to be done away with, and so he tries on more than one occasion to kill David and have him eliminated, and David then went on the run. Uh, I made mention during that study that we believe, scholars believe, that David was on the run for his life from Saul for about 10 years, which is a long time to be suffering. It's a long time to have circumstances uh, be such that you're looking over your shoulder each and every moment for uh, every day, 365 days a year times 10. And I recognize that There are people that have uh, suffered in silence for even longer times, but the story uh, and the testimony that comes from people who have pointed their life's direction towards the Lord and become a person after God's own heart is this, that just like David during that 10 years, there's a great devotion shown to the Lord and not just an acknowledgement that God is great, an acknowledgement that He is worthy of our praise and worthy of our lives, but a a willingness to trust him and then obey him in honoring people the way that God would have. And two episodes just stand out where David had an opportunity to take Saul out on his own, Uh, but in both instances, his devotion to the Lord and to the higher things of God uh, won out and he would not touch the Lord's anointed, and by doing so or refusing to do so, he trusted God, who would ultimately deliver him. Uh, In God's deliverance of David from the hand of Saul, uh, David ascends to the throne of a united kingdom. He becomes king over all of Israel, and one of the first things that he does is he, re- he, he, he replaces, remember, the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of God, which had been lost in battle and then sent back to Israel and then kind of just hanging out on the outskirts of their society. David, because of his devotion, I believe, uh, decides that that's not good enough for God. God's intention was that he inhabited the center of his people, that he, w- that he dwelled among his people, right in the middle of his people, and the ark of God represented his presence. And so David goes and he gets, he gets the ark, and through a long process of making mistakes, he wasn't perfect, but making some mistakes and getting it figured it out, figured out, He moves the ark of God back to its rightful position in the center of their society. And when he does, he worships God. And he worships him in such a way that I believe is filled and overflowing with humility because he removed his royal robes uh, in a sign of humility that there was one greater than him there. There was a king that was more important than him there. And he danced. And you remember his wife, Michael, was pretty upset about that, criticized him, accused him of desiring to have the attention of the young maidens by dancing in his underwear. And I know that uh, teachers and Sunday school teachers and pastors have made a big deal about David dancing in his underwear. But in reality, uh, I think you can make a case that the more important thing was going on was David was showing an act of humility, one that Saul would have never shown on him on his own. And he removed his royal robes in humility before the presence of God and worshipped him uh, in in such a way that people considered it undignified. But David, as a man after God's own heart, believed that God was worthy to be worshipped and the critics were not to be worried about, uh, that God's honor was even more important than the critics or criticism that would come his way. Then... Uh, Moving on, David's comfortable, things are good, and you remember that famous line where he says, is there anyone left in the family of Saul and Jonathan that I can show kindness to? And David searches out, and he brings Mephibosheth into his court. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, who 
had been crippled in running away. And um, he brings him in this broken, um, destroyed, beat down, poverty stricken man, all because of the way kings were back then. David turns the tables and says, no, 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 I'm going to actually have you eat at my table. A person after God's own heart will give to others what they himself have gotten from God, mercy, compassion, and grace. Now, I don't know about you, but if you're following along, you're thinking, man, David was amazing. Um, but he wasn't, because shortly after that moment where there's this high spiritual moment where he's extending the mercy of God in a miraculous way to another man, uh, he falls to temptation. And we all know the story of David and Bathsheba. But it's important for us to understand that a person after God's own heart should remain faithful in the face of temptation, should not give in. But if we do, we know that God is gracious and can forgive us even as we confess our sins. It's an important piece to remember. It's not just that God will forgive us and it's no big deal, but we gotta confess, we have to recognize before God and one another that we have wronged God, that we have missed the mark, that we have done exactly the things that put Jesus to death on the cross. Like we have sinned in such a way. It, it, we, we can't see that lightly, but we know because of Jesus' willingness to live perfectly and then die as a sacrifice on our behalf, rise again on the third day, ascend to the Father, and, 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 and pray for our best on our behalf, um, we can know that even if we do make a mistake, and we do, that God is there to forgive even as we confess. Amen? That brings us to the, to the, to the last kind of part of David's life. If you want to read uh, 2 Samuel and get all of the, the drama and the detail about the last portion of David's life, you can go to Second or 1 Chronicles and read more detail. You can also pick things up in the Psalms. But the end of his life was filled with uh, turmoil, actually. There was the rebuke of the prophet and his own repentance. There were frustrations within his own family and fights for power. There was actually a rebellion and a civil war. David himself ended up running away again from one of his sons. There were wars and worries. The, excuse me, the end of David's life wasn't lollipops and gumdrops by any stretch. It was, in one sense, miserable and drama filled and yet all the way through David did ultimately at the end or near the end of his life if his life was a song he sang about the glory of God and not the frustrations he had he sang about God's faithfulness in the midst of tough times he sang about God's graciousness in the midst of regrets he sang of all that God's God was and I think that's one of the Great lessons from the life of David that as a person after God's own heart, which again is what we should desire to be, our life or the story of our lives should speak of the glory of our Lord. Does that make sense? And I, I, there's some great news in that because it doesn't matter if you're out there tuning in, it doesn't matter where you've been or what's going on right now. I trust that even as you are still breathing and moving and having your being, which is a gift from God, just like the rest of us in here, there's always another moment to begin to rightly recognize who God is and give him glory for that. David did so during the end of his life. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 22, if you want to turn there, that would be great. Uh, if you want something fun to do, you could also turn to Psalm chapter 18, uh, because it's the exact same words per se. But in 2 Samuel chapter 22, you kind of get this near the end of his life theme song about what his life was about. In Psalm, uh, 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse 1, it says, And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Now, remember, in that sense, you could say, well, wait a minute, wasn't that much earlier in his life? Well, don't forget that Hebrew literature, especially this kind of history, 
was organized more thematically than it was chronologically. And so we're getting this song at this point because it's marking the, the end of David's life and what was important to him. And David's life, if you will, was encapsulated in this song. And David's life was one in which he would, with much uh, enthusiasm and commitment, he would sing about the greatness of God. Look at verses uh, 2 through 4. David begins by saying this, The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Uh, it's such a, an amazing proclamation by David because what he is doing is allowing the song of his life or the story of his life to communicate that without a doubt he believed that God was, is, and always will be not only his, but even our refuge, that safe place. He uses a number of words. He uses the word fortress, he uses the word shield, stronghold, savior. He uses the word refuge, the one in whom I take refuge, the one in whom I find safety, the one in the, the, the relationship in which I feel secure and protected. This is what a, a refuge and a fortress and a stronghold is. He says in verse 4, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies. Uh, near the end of David's life, he realized that looking back that in any moment, whether it was with Goliath or the wars with the Philistines or any of the other uh, nations around them or even the struggles within his own people or even within his own family or remember with his own flesh, he believed without a doubt that the Lord was worthy to be praised because he had saved him from all of his enemies. And in so doing, David learned that the Lord was his refuge, his safety, his protection. It's a really good word for us, not only as a reminder that the same is true for us, but also as an encouragement that this is, this, this should be part of the story of our life. When people hear of our testimony, when we tell people of our story, when we recount this moment or that, in some way, shape, or form, it should include the reality that God himself has been our safety. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, uh, 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 the church, the sanctuary is my safe place. And I understand that in one sense because there is a building and a property set apart for God and there's even a space within the building on the property set apart to worship the Lord. But remember, without the presence of the Lord, it's just a unique building. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I think we could all recognize, we're going to look at this next Sunday, that this coming Sunday, we're going to look at a moment where God tells Moses to take off his sandals because the place in which he was standing was holy ground. And it's not as if there was something unique about that place. There was something unique about who was in that place, and it wasn't Moses. Are you right? And so the, the beauty of that is this, man. If we feel a sense of safety and security at the church, we have to remember that's because this is the place that the Lord is, right? It's the Lord's house, so to speak. But the, but the safety and security we feel about that place is because of his presence, which, by the way, <laughs> follows us wherever we may go because he lives within us through his spirit. And so there really is this sense that no matter where we are in this world, there is a, an opportunity to take refuge from the storms of life in the presence of God through our relationship. And we access that refuge by reading his word, <laughs> right? But that's what we're talking about. And the reason we're talking about it is because we found it in the scriptures. So we access that, that safe sense, right? 
by reading his word. We access it by interacting with his people. Man, I hope and pray that our, our influence that we have on one another is one that promotes the security that God provides. I hope, if you will, that on behalf of our Lord, we are safe ears and we have safe eyes and our very presence is his presence as a place of refuge, security, and safety for those who are seeking such things. And I got to be honest, I think there's a lot of people seeking those things. Unfortunately, if, if we're being really honest, a lot of people are seeking those things in ways and in places that aren't going to provide them. And sometimes they're doing so because, for lack of a better way of describing it, we've let them down because our Christian communities haven't always been safe. And yet we have this amazing opportunity to not only let the testimony of our life speak of the refuge that God is for us, the safety and security stronghold that he is, but also the practice and the living of our life gets to show that as well. David moves on in verse 5, and he says, The waves of death encompassed me. The torrents of destruction assailed me. The cords of Sheol entangled me. The snares of death confronted me. Uh, even as we're reading that, can you like imagine the different moments that maybe David with, was thinking about through his life, you know, when he's explaining what it felt like? He says in verse 7, In my distress, I called upon the Lord. To my God, I called. From his temple, he heard my voice, and my cry came to his ears. Then the earth reeled and rocked. The foundations of the heavens trembled and quaked because he was angry. The sense is that he is angry on David's behalf. Smoke went up from his nostrils and devouring fire from his mouth. Glowing coals flamed forth from him. He bowed the heavens and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. He was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness around him his canopy. Thick clouds, a gathering of water. Out of the brightness before him, coals of fire flamed forth. The Lord thundered from heaven, and the Most High uttered his voice. And he sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and routed them. The channels of the sea were seen. The foundations of of the world were laid bare at the rebuke of the Lord, at the last, at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. <laughs> David, in one sense, and I love this, uh, we have in these verses an amazing example of what is known as anthropomorphic language. Anthropomorphic language is ascribing to God human traits or physical traits as just a way to try to describe his character. And we know that God is much more than the sum of all of these things, but language is what he's given us, and so we do our best to ascribe that, right? And so what we're reminded of, even through these descriptions, we're reminded that according to David, God was a sure and mighty defender. That God answered his prayers and moved in such a way that David was rescued from what he calls the waves of death, the torrents of destruction, and the cords of Sheol. Like the Lord, if you will, according to David, came down and defended him. And that's how David described God's faithfulness and faithful working in all of his circumstances. And the same is true for you and I. What's interesting is we read the language, the waves of death encompassed me. I'll be honest with everyone. I have never been near death physically, as far as I can tell. I mean, I'm quite sure that I'm closer than I've ever been before, which is true for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> Amen. But physically, like I've never, I mean, I remember, I remember having pneumonia during the summer as an 11-year-old kid. Pneumonia in the summer is the worst, by the way. Because when you're out supposed to be playing baseball in Little League and going to the creeks and rivers and lakes and running through the sprinklers, I was on a couch for a month 
because I had pneumonia. But the best that I can recall at 11, there wasn't one moment where I thought I was going to die. Maybe it was childish naivety. But I didn't feel like I felt terrible. But I didn't feel like I was going to die. I have never, if you will, felt the torrents of destruction just buffeting me over and over and over. My life hasn't as many of ours, it hasn't been free from pain or struggle or frustration or hurt. But man, I got to be honest. It's been pretty decent. You know what I mean? It has not been bad. The cords of Sheol entangled me and the snares of death confronted me. I've never gotten, I, 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 I don't even know what that feels like. Like I imagine it, we've been paddle boarding as of late out at Lake of the Woods and there are certain parts along the shore, maybe a hundred feet offshore as you're paddle boarding, you're standing up and you can see, and Lake of the Woods is a high mountain lake, so it's pretty clear and you can see what's on, what's, what's down there. And on more than one occasion as I've seen the, the long flowy vegetation, do you guys like that? Long flowy veg, try to, I try to give a hundred percent here the long, flowy vegetation, there's been more than one moment where I've tried to, in my mind, you know, you plan ahead for every contingency. And what happens if one of those boats in the no-wake zone makes a big wake in the zone, right? And I fall off and I go down there and I get tangled. What am I going to do? You know what I mean? I've imagined it. It's pretty terrible to imagine, but I've never felt it. I've never experienced that. I haven't fallen off. You just kind of ride it out and you look. But for David, he's describing what the hurt that he experienced in his life felt like. He's describing what the, uh, what the, the, the people that had turned their back on him, what that felt like to him. He's describing, uh, obviously, without a doubt, being on the run from Saul and his life literally being in danger. He's describing that. And I think, though, it's important for us to realize he's also most likely describing maybe that moment after the prophet Nathan came, before he repented, what his own sin felt like. And I think that's important for us, right? Because when we make mistakes, quite often those mistakes are followed up by, for lack of a better term, attacks from the enemy who would like nothing more than to steal, kill, and destroy us, our lives if he can, our faith and belief at all costs. And it's important to realize that that that's what's happening. So we've all felt, we maybe haven't felt those things, but we've all felt that thing, right? And David describes how mighty his defender God was. That his defender God, who came down and rescued him from all of these things, was mightier in his description than anything on earth in the earth, around the earth, anything. And that's a good and important reminder for us because that's what our lives should sing about. That's what our lives should, that's a part of the story that our lives should tell is that we have a mighty defender in Yahweh who came down powerfully through his son. And it didn't necessarily look like that, but I guarantee you his life, death, Resurrection and ascension was more powerful than any presence the world has ever known. And he's the one who sits at the right hand of the Father as our defense attorney defending us. So when the voices of inadequacy and the voices of condemnation and the voices of guilt and the voices of frustration and, 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 and uh, lowliness come upon us, We have to remember that just as he was for David, he still is for us a mighty defender. I mean, we could stop there and it'd be a great night, but David just keeps going. Verse 17, he sent from on high and he took me and he drew me out of many waters. He's describing that he was overwhelmed and drowning, right, in his circumstances. He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. 
They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place and he rescued me because he delighted in me. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Not only does David tell of God's ability to defend, but he also speaks of his ability to rescue. And I got news for us as a church. This rescuer theme is just going to keep going uh, for a while because we're in the book of Exodus where God provides a rescuer through Moses to help to, to rescue his people out of the, the bondage in Egypt. But this is what David's saying. So what's amazing is that all of these things are backed up throughout Scripture. But David says, He rescued me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. He rescued me, verse 20, because he delighted in me. Because he delighted in me. Have you ever, have you ever, have you ever helped somebody out out of obligation? Just because you are expected to help them out. It's what you're supposed to do. And then contrast that with a, maybe a moment that you helped somebody out because you loved them. And what that felt like and how that worked out. They look similar, but internally they're so much different. And it makes a huge difference on the one who's being rescued, doesn't it? The one who's being helped. If they sense that you're just helping out of obligation, huh, thanks. But if they sense that the help is coming to them from a person who loves them, you might even use the term delights in them, man, it has a profound effect on their lives. We should put ourselves in that place and recognize that his rescuing of us is based on his delight, his delight. Remember, one of the most famous Bible verses in all the world, for all time, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He rescued because he loves. Does that make sense? Like there's this delight. I don't know about you, but man, I, I, <laughs> if I'm not careful, if we're not careful, it's easy for our lives to be filled with one moment after another, whether it's the news, whether it's social media, Facebook, whatever it is that people are using these days, uh, critical people around us, our, our families, our friends, whatever. It's pretty easy to fall into these ruts where everybody's telling us how terrible we are or how much we ha don't add up or what didn't go right, so on and so forth. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy to feel like there's not really anybody who takes delight in me. But it's important to remember, among all the voices that are yelling and screaming and, and trying to get our attention, for better or worse, there is God's, and his voice says, no, I delight in you. It's why I rescued you. This is what David sings about. David, very imperfect man. David, he's singing about that, that God is not only his refuge, his defender, his rescuer, but he's also his rewarder. Look at verse 21. The Lord dealt with me according to my righteousness, according to the cleanness of my hands. He rewarded me, for I have kept the ways of the Lord and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his rules were before me, and from his statutes I did not turn aside. I was blameless before him, and I kept myself from guilt. And the Lord has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his sight. Uh, again, super easy to get this confused. It's super easy to think that maybe David did live a perfect life, but we've already seen that he didn't. So what is he talking about here? Well, remember in the Old Testament, righteousness was based on a faithful belief in God, and there was that in David and so when there is this reward for his righteousness, it's, it's in reality, David is saying, God, God recognized my belief. It was human and the best I could do in any given certain moment, but it was genuine and authentic. Remember, God says when he looks at David's life close up and then from a distance, he says, that was a man after my own heart. And there's this reward that comes with it. It wasn't silver and gold or things perishable. But it was the imperishable, imperishable presence of God's love in his life. And he sang of that. 
And it's important. As we sing of that, remember, we're on this side of the cross. David's life was one that was looking forward to the cross, but we're looking back on it. And as we look back on how God could see us as righteous, we're reminded that because of the blood of Jesus, because of the sacrifice of Christ, that God has robed us in his righteousness. And that in and of itself is the reward. And so when we uh, allow our lives to tell that story, remember, we're not bragging and boasting about what it is that we got. What we're doing is we're making it known who it is that gave it to us and gave it for us. Does that make sense? It's kind of a fantastic place, right? Because it's not contingent on materialism or consumerism, or any other kind of ism that stacks up stuff. It's not contingent on how many cars, or what kind they are, how many pairs of shoes, or what kind they are, whatever, how how big our bank accounts are, any of those things. It's not contingent on any of that stuff. The reward is his righteousness. And the point of proclaiming it is not to talk about it as much as we talk about him if that makes sense. David continues on in verse 26. He says, With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. With the purified, you deal purely. And with the crooked, you make yourself seem torturous. Just keep that in mind as we go back next Sunday and the following Sundays and we consider the Israelites in Egypt and specifically Pharaoh. You save a humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty to bring them down. For you are my lamp, O Lord, and my God. And my God lightens my darkness. For by you I can run against a troop, and by my God I can leap over a wall. This God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield for all those who take refuge in him. David speaks of God's lightness, that he lights his path, and there is a way of righteousness that is seen to him. And and that effect, he uses language. But the effect that, that, that the Lord's light, the Lord's illumination, the Lord's way, the Lord's path has on him is it fills him with such confidence that he begins to feel as if there, there's nothing I can't do. There's no place I can't go if the Lord is leading me, so to speak. And we've all heard stories and seen stories of people that follow God that way. And I love when we hear those stories. I love when I come across those stories because they inspire us. But it's important to also recognize that It's not just those stories. It's our story. The reality that God is our light. There are going to be people who ask, and especially as we come back together at church, there's going to be people who ask, how'd you get here? And you can talk about, well, you know, on one day I went on the internet. This is my story. I went on the internet and I was looking for a church to go where nobody knew me and I could just be left alone and this church popped up and I came, right? Uh, Or, 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 while that's all true, we could say, you know what? It was nothing less than the illumination of God's light, not only in my life, but in this church and in this way that brought me to this place. And it's not just my story. It's your story and your story and your story and your story. It's our story, right? And that's, there's a beauty in that, in recognizing, even as David did, that there's humility and, and there's mercy to be found in the Lord's the light of the Lord's love, as we have called it in the past. There's mercy to be found there. There's hope to be found there. There's leading to be found there. There's confidence to be found there. There's there's energy to be found there. There's excitement to be found there. Um, There is safety, once again, to be found there. Verse 32, David says, For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? This God is my strong refuge, and he has made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer, and he set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation, and and your gentleness made me great. 
You gave a wide place for my steps under me, and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and destroyed them and did not turn back until they were consumed. I consumed them. I thrust them through so that they did not rise. They fell under my feet. Don't forget, in the context of David's life and the victories that he had over his enemies, from a big picture perspective, David was simply an instrument of judgment that God was using to judge the world for their sin, which is his right to do, which also shouldn't make us question the character of God. It should actually make us commit more to God because he has exercised that same judgment in our life, but he's not counting our sins against us. Why? Because his son took our place and shed his blood in our place. Verse 40, For you equipped me with strength for the battle, and you made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me, those who hated me, and I destroyed them. They looked, but there was none to save. They cried to the Lord, but he did not answer them. I beat them fine as the dust of the earth. I crushed them and stamped them down like the mire of the streets. Now, as we read these pass- these verses, we're reminded, even as David is saying, that God was his strength. And his strength caused him to have total and complete victory over all of his enemies. Now, some of us might get real fired up at this time and say, <laughs> Yes, the neighbor who wronged me. I have God's green light and his promise of strength to crush them into fine dust under my feet. I, uh, hopefully you get the ridiculousness of that, because I just don't think that's God's heart. I do believe with all of my heart right now, in our current circumstances, in our current reality, and I only wish there were more people here to listen. I only wish there were more people online. I do believe it is easy very easy, way too easy, I suggest, to misunderstand who the enemy is. I don't believe with my heart that the enemy is somebody else who has a different opinion. I don't believe that the enemy is the enemy that needs to be crushed. I don't believe these are verses that give us a green light to slander and call politicians names. I think Christian conduct, Christ-like living, requires something better for us and from us. I, I recognize that the political climate and the division thereof and the frustrations thereof and the differences thereof are only gonna ramp up in the next few months, I get that. But my hope and prayer is that we as believers would rise above it all and recognize that somebody from another party or with another opinion is not ultimately the enemy. I would suggest to you that we do have a real enemy, one that Jesus himself describes as prowling around like a roaring lion. And I would hope that we wouldn't be used by the enemy to devour one another simply because we may see something differently. I would hope that we could rise above it all and recognize that the enemies that we need rescued from, for lack of a better way of describing it, is Satan and his henchmen. And his henchmen, the spirits that I speak of, it's the spirit of division and it's the spirit of judgment and it's the spirit of hate. And I would hope that we would recognize that the Lord can strengthen us against the enemy of our souls and his henchmen. I would hope (laughs) that we would see that God has a high calling for us, his people. And as we trust him, We believe that he's going to work all things out together for good and that we can hope in him. The reality is this. There's always going to be different opinions. There's always going to be different ideas. 
we should hold on to the reality of, of God being a God over them all to where we understand, yes, truth, and truth is non-negotiable. But man, there's a lot of different things going on. There's a lot of hate going on. There's a lot of judgment going along. There's a lot of, un, like, I don't even, it can even be fair, but there's a lot of, like, it's a, you may have a difference of opinion with somebody else about maybe a political policy or maybe about something that's happening, but I don't believe as Christians it gives us the right to call them derogatory names. I don't believe as Christians it gives us the right to judge them to hell, damn them to hell. I think as Christians, Jesus made it very clear that we're to, not only love our enemies, but pray for them as well. In the meantime, not get distracted by what's happening on earth that we miss what's happening in the spiritual world where we're really being attacked by a real enemy and his henchmen. May we look to the Lord to strengthen us. Verse 44. By the way, that's about as political as I tend to get, just so we all know. Verse 44. You delivered me from strife with my people. You kept me as the head of the nations. People whom I had not known served me. Foreigners came cringing to me, and as soon as they heard of me, they obeyed me. Foreigners lost heart and came trembling out of their fortresses. Verse 47, the Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be my God, the rock of my salvation. The God who gave me vengeance and brought down peoples under me, who brought me out of my enemies, you exalted me above those who rose against me. You delivered me from men of violence. For this I will praise you, O Lord, among the nations and sing your praise and sing praises to your name. Great salvation he brings to his king and shows steadfast love to his anointed, to David and his offspring forever. And what's interesting, if we, if we trace our spiritual roots as a Christian family back, we, even through the covenant that God made with Abraham, and then Moses, and then David, and then the new covenant of Christ and His blood, we're that offspring that God is willing to bring great salvation to and show steadfast love to. Again, not, a, not only should our lives celebrate the strength that God can give us or the light that God is for us or the rewards that God is, our rescue and so on and so forth, but it should also sing of the reality that He is our salvation, which is what David said. Now, I know that <laughs> we have like two minutes. It's because I talked too much at the beginning but let me just say this. I believe with all of my heart that as we consider the end of David's life and the story that his life told, it was a story that really was all about God, that we have that same profound privilege of letting the story of our lives speak of the glory of God and the glory of the Lord. 1 Peter 2, 9 says that we are a, because of Christ, we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. That because of our Savior, we have a significance. And that significance gives us something. The significance is that we have something to say about Jesus. He says that we're a chosen race, that we have been picked out and preferred. That we are a royal priesthood. We are those who are uniquely set apart, not to serve our own ideas and agendas, but to serve God's. We are a holy nation, meaning a, a community of Christ-like individuals, set apart. We are a people for His own possession, a group that God has gathered so that His glory could be shown. Like, this is what He says. There's a significance. You remember just a few minutes ago when I was going off on my own little rant about the state of what's going on around us? And you remember when I said that I think that, that God calls us as Christians to a, to a higher conduct. We are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And because of this significance, we have something to say about our Savior. The rest of 1 Peter 2, 9 says this, that we are all of these things so that we may proclaim the excellencies of him who called us out of darkness 
and into his marvelous light. I suggest that's what David's life story was all about, and so should ours be as well.